Welcome to church. We gather to worship an amazing God who created the heavens, the earth, all that lives, crucified, buried, risen, holy. Jesus is good. Jesus is forever. You are loved. You are accepted. You belong. Welcome to Revision Church. Good morning, Revision Church family. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's having a wonderful morning. Yes, same here. How you doing, Pastor Gina? So good to see you. Good to see you as well. I'm doing good. How about you? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm happy that it's cooling down a little bit. The weather has been in the 60s mm -hmm. here in Atlanta, so I'm loving it. Yes, I love it. I can do without the humidity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, church family, we're so excited that you decided to worship with us today on the second Saturday of the month. Listen, we're completely virtual this Saturday. We want to see where you all are worshiping with us from. So go ahead, drop your name and your location in the chat. And we just want to say a good hearty revision. Hello to you. Go ahead and drop it in the chat. Well, Keisha McCree, good morning from Loganville. Good morning. Awesome. Good morning, Keisha. Hey, who else we got? We got Will Carroll. Good morning, church fam. Hey, how you doing, Will? <laughs> awesome. We got Adrian Cheatham says, good morning. We good say morning. Oh, good morning right back to you. Hey. <laughs> oh, he said from New Jersey. Will Carroll's in New Jersey. Awesome. So happy that you tune in with us from the Northeast. Hey try area natalie braswell williams blessings from newport rhode island okay we this is is in here this morning oh yeah you know pastor Jean, you from the ct you yes. know from from new york uh we got north the northeast is representing this morning mm -hmm, i love it <laughs> tanisha uh konnichiwa from the spencers hello, hello. Uh, our, our revision family all the way in tokyo uh so happy that you all are worshiping with us Awesome. We have Keisha Kesha. I hope I'm not saying your name wrong. Lake says, happy Sabbath family and happy Sabbath right back to you. So glad you're joining us this morning. Yes. Yeah, so happy. So happy. Fifi, happy Sabbath from Sacramento, California. Blessings to everyone. Awesome. So happy that you're worshiping with us, Fifi, all the way from California, three hours behind us. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. What else we got? It's okay. Uh, it says happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Let us know where you're from, where you're joining us from. Okay. Hey, Jessica Cook. Happy Sabbath from Atlanta. Hey, Jessica. From the awesome. Good stuff. Christine Scott says, good morning, everyone from Covington, Georgia. Hey, Covington. Just right down the road. Okay. Awesome. Annette Dickens, our revisionaire. Happy Sabbath from South Carolina. Okay. South Carolina. I just visited her last month and I love it. I love oh, really? It. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Pretty good. Awesome. Dale Blake, remote in my car. Hey. Hello. We look in our driver. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but hello, hello. Hey, be, be safe, Dale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be safe, you know. Eyes on the road. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Arsenio, happy Sabbath from Angola, Africa. Ooh. I love it. Okay, our revisionaires are really in the building. Arena uh, says, happy Sabbath from Arizona. Mm, okay. I wonder what the temperature is like in Arizona now. I know it was hot this summer. Yeah. It was hot, hot. Yeah. Okay. I hope I'm saying this right, but Sikani, happy Sabbath from Costa Rica. All right. Beautiful Costa Rica. All right. Awesome. 
Arima says happy Sabbath from Portugal. We got another revisionary in here. Welcome. Hey, hey, Welcome. I heard Portugal is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're so happy that so many of you all are worshiping with us today and worshiping with us from here in Atlanta area, from around the nation, and even across the globe. We're so happy that you chose to worship with us this morning. This is our opportunity for us to connect with one another. Um, oftentimes when we're in, uh, when we're virtual, it doesn't feel like we can have that physical connection like we can when we're in person. But hey, here at Revision, we truly believe in connection. We believe in community. And so today we actually have some really cool connection questions that Pastor Gina, you're going to lead us up in. Yes. So our first connection question is a, it's kind of a trivia, true and false question. Mm. And the question is, absentee voting allows you to vote before Election Day by mail or Dropbox. Is that mm. true or false? Put it in the chat and let's see what people are saying. OK, absentee voting. All right. This is these some good questions. OK, good yeah. questions. Absentee yeah. voting. Our revision knowledge here today. Yeah. Natalie Braswell says true. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Says true. Christine Scott says true. All right. Lorena Smith says true. Mm -hmm. All right. JS, what's going on, my friend? He says true. Annette Dickens says true. Will Carroll says true. Maxine, true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kenny, what's going on, Kenny? Kenny says true too. It seems like everybody says it's true. Yeah, it was true. true. Yeah, and this was an easy question, and everyone got it right. It is true. Absentee voting allows you to vote before election day by mail or dropping it off at a polling station. Uh, so our next question is also a true and false. Um, it is if you are registered to vote but forgot your ID at a polling station you are therefore not allowed to vote Ooh. true or false if you forgot your id at home hmm. and you go to the polling station mm -hmm. is it true or false that you are not allowed to then vote that day mm, natalie brasso says true I, I honestly i don't know the answer to this one z says false because i've always brought my id just mm -hmm. because i know that they always ask for it so I don't know. My assumption is maybe maybe this is true if you don't have your ID. I I, I don't know. Like this is a good question. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see what others are saying. Ever says false. Okay. Yeah. Amber says she's thinking about it too. Hey, <laughs> Amber, you and I are in the same boat. I really don't know. Jessica Cook says false. All right. Christine Scott says true. Okay. Mm -hmm. Belinda Barr says true. All right. Amber says false. All right, now Amber, Amber's coming back. She's like, okay, I know it's false. Okay. <laughs> All right. Keisha Lake says false. All right. Well, Carol says true with a question mark. <laughs> okay. Kind of skeptical there. Okay. Annette Dickens says false. All right. All right. Lorena Smith said, don't know, always vote by mail. Hey, she said, I'm always, I'm always sending mine in by mail. <laughs> Linda Stevenson says, says in California, that's false. So she said in California, where mm -hmm. she's at, that's false. Okay. Asia Chino said, I think it's true. Got to have your ID to verify residence. That's what, that's what I thought, too. You know? I mean, I don't know, Pastor Gina. Help us out here. So the answer is false. Mm. It is false. If you, you are legally allowed to vote if you forgot your ID at home, or have been removed from the registration system, you can then cast a, what is called a provisional ballot. Mm -hmm. And all voters are entitled to this right by federal law. So if you forgot your ID and they say, actually, you need to go home, tell them, mm -mm, that's not what the law says. Yeah, okay. I like that question, Pastor Gina. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, that's really good to know. Cause I would assume like, man, I don't got my ID. They told me to go home. I probably would think I would have to, but yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I love that. All right, we got two more. Our next one, also a true and false. Um, and it is prisoners and misdemeanor felons in Georgia cannot vote. Mm. Is that true or false? Good that question. prisoners or mis misdemeanor felons in Georgia cannot vote. That's a good question right there. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, okay. Pastor Gina, she educating us this morning. <laughs> on a voting system. Listen, Natalie Braswell says true. Okay. Huh? All right. Let's see. Who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, Christine Scott says, great to know our rights. Exactly. That's hey, nice. great to know. We got to know our rights. Uh, Belinda Barr says false. Okay. Huh? All right. Mm -mm. Let's see. Who else? Who else? I know people probably weren't ready to have, you know, their wheels turning this morning. Yeah, yeah. You got us thinking. You got <laughs> us thinking. I'm I want to say false too, but I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I won't say false, you know. <laughs> uh Amber, see, these are tough. Feels tricky. That's hey, Amber, she's trying to, I feel that too. <laughs> yeah, but these are good questions though. I think if you have a felony, you can't vote. That's what mm -hmm. said. Okay. All right. Okay, Amber said, can you repeat the question, please? Okay, so the statement is prisoners and misdemeanor felons in Georgia cannot vote. True or false? Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna cast I'm gonna cast my vote and say false. False? Okay. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say false. Okay. Uh, all right. Maxine H says false. Okay. Jessica Cook says false. All right. Kisa Francis says true. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Glenda Stevenson says, I'm, tr I'm going to say true. Mm. Okay. All right. Michael Scott says false. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Pastor Gina, what, what are we looking like? So the answer is, and I feel like there should be a drummer hole here, but a little, <laughs> the answer is false. Okay. You not lose your right to vote if you are convicted. Uh, of a misdemeanor in Georgia. You can vote mm -hmm. while awaiting trial or even if you're incarcerated for a misdemeanor. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay. Awesome. That's a great question. It's good to know. Awesome. All right, Pastor Gene, you said you got one more for us. One more. One more. Right. I think this one may not be too tricky. Let's okay. see. This one is a question and it okay. is about what percentage of voters turn out mm -hmm. for local slash federal elections in their state? About what percentage? Is it A, 60%, B, 26%, or C, 87%? Okay, so about what percentage of voters turn out for local and federal elections in their state? So are we saying specifically the state of Georgia? Uh, this is the average over all 50 states. Oh, over all 50 states. Okay, mm -hmm. got you. So what percentage of voters on average come out for federal and local? Mm -hmm. Got you. Natalie Brassel says A. Okay. Okay. All right. Glenda Stevenson says B. All right. Awesome. Mrs. Barnes says A. All right. Uh, Dr. Kendenda Thompson uh, says B. Okay. Okay. Nat Dickens says B. Tracy says B. Will Carroll says A. Okay. All right. We have a myriad of responses. That sounds like math. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. That just sounds like math. Not my forte. Amber says maybe A, but would hope for C. Okay. All right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Pastor Gina. And the know. answer, the answer is B. An average about 26% of voters turn out. And even some mayors have been elected with fewer than 10% of wow. voters coming to the polls for local and federal elections. Wow. Woo. So, yeah, what Amber said, we would love for it to be C, to be 87%, but a lot of people do not turn out for their local or federal um, mm -hmm. elections. So today we at Revision are hosting a voter education forum to help inform people about their local and um, federal elections coming up, to answer questions, any burning questions you have. No question is too small for this voter uh, education forum we're having 
today at 3.30. You can scan the QR code here on the screen and it will bring you to um, our Eventbrite site that will give you all the information, the location. You can sign up. It is not too late to join in and to learn more about voting. Even if you are a totally experienced and you think you know everything, come get some knowledge to share with someone or bring someone who may be a first time voter um, and just ask some questions. Anyone can join and we just hope to see everyone there to learn a little bit more about voting. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that, Pastor Gina, and for taking us through those questions this morning. I think us having forums like this is so important so that as you know, Miss Christine Scott says, so that we can know our rights, you mm -hmm. know, like sometimes we have an assumption that we just know in reality, sometimes we don't know. And so, like you said, like we can never know too much. So yeah. I really appreciate you being able to coordinate this for revision so that we can know our rights and educate ourselves on our voting rights. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, as you all know, that's it's happening this evening. We encourage you to come out. Also for the month of October is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month as well. And so next week for the shift, the shift is back at Wednesday at seven o'clock. We're going to be having a shift centered around breast cancer awareness and it's going to be entitled I Am a Survivor. So we encourage you to tune in for that. Listen, Revision Church family, God is moving in our community in a miraculous way. We want you to know that small groups are starting back up at the end of this month. That's right, small groups are starting back up. So we encourage you to sign up today, all right? And so go ahead, take a moment, scan that QR code and sign up today for our small groups and be a part. We've been talking about it for the last couple of weeks and we're just so excited because our small groups are going to look a little bit different this time. We're going to have in-person small groups, virtual small groups, and we're also going to have groups specific for uh, particular demographics as well. And so, listen, we encourage you to sign up for our small groups. And listen, church family, all of this is possible because each and every single week, you all are faithful in your giving. And we're so grateful that you all constantly give to Revisions Ministry. And so we encourage you to continue giving. You can do so through our website at revisionchurchatlanta.org. And you can also continue to do so through our PayPal account at Revision Church Atlanta as well. And so again, we want to say thank you because the way in which we're able to do ministry is possible because of your continual and faithful giving. Church family, we have so much to be thankful to God for, and we have so much to pray to God for. So at this time, Pastor Gina is going to uh, lead us into a season of prayer. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Jordan. Uh, before we take time to pray, I just want to share with you a verse that really blessed me this week. Mm -hmm. This week, I found myself um, really excited, having high moments and also having low moments. And when it came to prayer, there were just times I couldn't find the words. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find the words to express exactly how I was feeling. And I found comfort in Romans 8, 26. I'm going to read the message version just really quickly. Romans 8, 26, that says, Meanwhile, the moment we get tired and waiting, God's spirit is right alongside us, helping us along. If we don't know what to pray or how to pray, it doesn't matter. He does praying for us, making prayer out of our wordless signs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our conditions and keeps us present before God. Mm. That is why we are to be so sure that every detail in our lives, God is working through. So even in those moments, I'm sure I'm not the only one, in those moments when we just don't know, we don't have the words to pray how we're feeling and what we're experiencing, the Spirit he translates our signs and our groans and even our tears Mercy. of sadness or happiness to Mercy. the Lord when we can't yeah. find the words. Yeah. So I'm going to lead us out in prayer, but also towards the end, I'm going to have a moment for everyone to just pray without words. Mm. To just pray if it's with groans, with maybe clapping of the hands, whatever mm. expresses how you're feeling. Uh, just give you a moment. It'll be a moment of silence for everyone just to pray in that way. So mm -hmm. wherever you are, 
we just ask that you get in a position of prayer, whether that's standing, kneeling, uh, laying prostrate for some people, whatever it is, let us pray. God, we are so thankful for another day of life. Yes. Are here because of you. Mm -hmm. We've made it through this week with the highs and the lows that have come our way, that have shown up on our timelines, that have showed up in our text messages. God, you know everything that we have encountered and we are here. Yeah, We don't take that for granted. So we first start by saying thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you that we are present, that we are breathing, that we have even mustered the strength to be here on the line to worship with our Vision Church family, God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We thank you also for the many blessings we've encountered this week, for health, for strength, for providing food and uh, money when we didn't even know where it would come from. We thank mm -hmm. you for helping you know, our cars be safe, to help us as we travel be safe on the roads and in the airplanes. God, we thank you. We thank you for homes to be in. We thank you for family. We thank you for friends, God. We thank you. Whatever it is, God, you know exactly what we are rejoicing for in life. We say thank you. We also, Lord, are so happy that we can present things that are troubling us, God, Right now, we pray for those who are struggling with uh, seasonal depression, Father. You know how their moods can really alter because of the weather changes. And God, we pray for them that you would uplift them, that you would help these individuals find ways to bring about joy, even when the sun isn't shining so bright. We yeah. pray that you would bring them a community to bring smiles to their faces when the sun is not shining so bright, and that yeah. they would find ways to praise you the yeah. state of the season changes, God. We also pray for those who are grieving and who are brokenhearted, Father. Your word mm -hmm. says that you will mend broken hearts. You are close to those who are brokenhearted. So, Father, we pray that you draw close in a special way towards them. You show them your love, your, give them your peace, uh, and give them your strength to get through the day. Mm -hmm seasons and the times where they are brokenhearted and grieving. And Father, we send up a special prayer for those in Gaza and Israel who are dealing with the effects of war. God, many of us cannot imagine what that is like, but we Mercy. see how things are on TV and on the news, yeah. social media, God, and we just lift up prayers for them right now. Mm -hmm. so, bring about peace, that you would bring about safety, that you would bring about comfort for those who are mourning, Father. Yeah. You just be God for them. Yes. And let them know that you have not left them, you are not forsake them, and you yeah. still watch over the earth. Mm -hmm. So, Father, now we take time to just let our groans and our moans and our <clears throat> expressions to be known to you. For some of us, we don't have the words to express everything that's going on, but we just take time now to just let us let to be and to pray even without words. Yeah. And we do so now. We thank you, God. We thank you that you hear our moans and our groans and our silent prayers and our tears, and you see our smiles and our frowns and whatever it is we're going through. We thank you that you see that, you hear all that. Uh -huh. Now, as we enter into prayer, we or we enter into praise and worship, we know that you have heard us. Uh -huh. That praise will not be in vain. It yeah. will not be just a praise that is um, not considerate of our pain, but it is praise 
Mm-hmm. It's including of our pain and that you hear. So we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh. Good morning, Revision Church. We are here to praise the Lord. He's our firm foundation. And I thank him. I give him praise and glory and honor. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And if you believe it, you need to stand up right now and give him glory and praise. He won't fail. I've still got joy in chaos. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under.
your spirit. He won't fail. Yeah. He won't fail. He won't fail. Just meditate on that real quick. He won't fail. Think about every situation. Everything that's going on and how God has showed up in victory for your situation. You're a good, good father. And we love you, Lord. And I'm just so thankful for your covering. I'm so thankful for your protection, for your provision, for your love, your mercy, your sovereignty. You don't got to do anything that you do for me. Not a, Not one thing you still show up every day so father we give you glory and praise I love you Lord for your mercy never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so. the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire for you have led me through the fire and all my days I've been held I've been held in your hands I've known you like a father I've known you like a father I've known you as a friend I've known you in the goodness of God
We're so thankful that your goodness is running after us. That is with us wherever we go. Father God, you are. You said you never leave us, nor forsake us. So right now, wherever you're at, just think about how he's with you right now in your situation. He's always with us. And I'm just so thankful that we serve a God that never leaves us, nor forsakes us. I have lived in the goodness of God. I have lived. I have lived in the goodness of God. I have lived in the goodness of God. I have lived. I have lived in the goodness of We are so grateful for God's goodness today. We bless him. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. How many of you know God has been good to you? That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. That's why we're still here in the midst and in spite of everything that we've been through. It's the goodness. It's the goodness of God. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're grateful that you are here with us in this virtual sanctuary as we come to worship our creator, our savior, our Messiah, our Lord. We're looking forward to this amazing time as we go to God's word. We've already been just blessed by the season and times of prayer and also the times of praise and worship. We're grateful to our praise team in leading us in songs of praise to God today. We want to remind you that we have something really important at 3.30 that we're doing because at Revision Church, we always want to be empowering you to be the very best, not just disciple of Jesus, but ambassador of the kingdom of Jesus that you can be. In order to do that, we are not only preparing us to be able to be ready when Christ returns, but also empowering you to represent Christ right in the here and now. Part of how we do that is exercise our blood-stained right to vote, our blood-bought right to vote. And in order to do that, you need to be educated and empowered. At 3.30 today, 3.30 today, it's right there on the screen. You can see the QR code. Uh, you can just open up your phone app, point it to the screen. You can get all the information that you need. Also, we're going to drop the address in the chat. We're dropping the address in the chat for those of you who need to get it that way so that you can be able to be there for our voter education forum today at 3.30. We're going to be in the Buckhead area as we talk about, and I love how our um, assistant pastors were talking about uh, the different uh, ideas around and even myths, uh, rumors around voting and what some of the rules are and the rules of engagement and, and how we are qualified or disqualified. What can we do to speak up for ourselves? We're going to do more of that and even more as we have experts on voting and voting rights at 3.30. We look to see you. Well, today there is a word from the Lord. I've got a message that I prepared and I want to say this um, as, is, as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive this word that we are living in a time that is just some terrible times. In fact, uh, the, the stuff that's going on, this military conflict in Israel and in the Gaza Strip has been one that's arrested our attention this week and in a real sense has saddened so many of us around the world as we see innocent people dying. We want you to know that as believers, I believe it is, our, it is our calling to be able to pray for peace wherever there is military conflict because there are always innocents on both sides, innocent people who get caught in the crosshairs uh, of these kinds of military conflicts. And so we are praying for 
the innocent children and women in both Israel and Gaza, the innocent men in both Israel and Gaza, as we have been bombarded by all of the news, some stories real, some fake this week. One thing we do know is that God is a God of peace and that he calls us to be peacemakers. In fact, he says that blessed are those who facilitate peace. So one of the ways that we can do that, if you felt powerless as you've watched these horrible images, both in Israel and in Gaza, this week is that we can pray. But today I also want to use uh, this, this very arresting story of what's going on in our time mm -hmm. to speak to us and to challenge us about our relationships and about our associations and what it is we are faced with and challenged with as we deal with conflict in our own lives. I must say this disclaimer that in no way do we want to uh, choose or pit people against each other or make some statement to kind of side with one against the other, as many Christians are doing and even our government has. But today I want to go to the word of God to show what the kingdom of God says that applies to every nation, tongue, and people. I'm going to do my best as I walk through some difficult terrain mm -hmm. where there are a lot of landmines in terms of political sensitivity and correctness. I am not a policy advisor or policy expert, but I am one who knows God's word and how God's word can be applied to us in these difficult times. So let's go to God's word today in the Bible, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. And I'm going to read a familiar passage. In fact, one that you've heard me preach before. In Matthew 26, I'm going to start in verse 47. And it says this in the English Standard Version. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him in verse 50, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? I want to point your attention back to verse 52. Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. Put your sword back. In its place. Today, I want to preach as the Spirit leads on the subject put it away. Put it away. Let's pray. God, right now, we need you. This world needs you. For this military conflict in Israel and Gaza, Lord, has not only arrested our attention, but it has arrested our conscience. All over the world, oh God, we are watching with horror as we see these terrible scenes unfold. And if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need you now. So speak to your people, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Put it away. 
I found it interesting in the midst of this, these arresting developments, these terrible developments in the Middle East this week, that another story, ironically, came up and also vied for our attention. In an interview between Hoda from the Today Show and Jada Pinkett Smith, it has been revealed that Jada and Will Smith have actually been separated since 2016. I only bring this up because the text that I read to you was the same text I used to address the issue of the physical assault by Will Smith on Chris Rock. And I, I find this, uh, this connection that it is interesting that while we were pitted against one another to choose sides, whether to go for Will, uh, who seemed to be avenging the honor of his wife, and Chris Rock, uh, who seemed to be insensitive in his comments and jokes about Jada, it is interesting to note the chronology of the events. For Jada says that they have been separated now for since 2016, which makes it now seven years. The physical assault of Chris Rock happened in 2022. And many people took sides in this conflict, and yet most people didn't understand the full context. Some defended Will because he was seen as protecting his queen and even getting revenge for what Chris did to his wife. But what we did not know is that while we were defending Will for his act of revenge on behalf of his wife, the two of them were separated for six years. I bring this up because while political pundits and political parties and ideologists are trying to get us to choose sides, and in America, they are pushing us always towards one side over the other, it is interesting that while we are pushed to choose sides, we are often ignorant of the context. We are often ignorant of what's happening behind the scenes, what has taken place that we are not aware of. And context matters. Because when you understand, or if you are uh, privileged to know what is happening behind the scenes, then we would have the restraint to be able to not always choose sides or always denigrate or bring down somebody else above one other, another person, yet we would have patience and we would pray for peace. It is interesting, there is always a context behind the conflict. I'm already okay. preaching. Okay. There's, already, there's always a context behind the conflict. I don't have time, I'm not a historical expert, but I can tell you that before you rush before you rush, before you're pushed by evangelicals to take the side of those who align with our political ideologies in America, before you push, you are pushed to be able to look down at those who have done wrong, understand that there is a context behind every conflict. Come here, I'm really talking about the scripture. For in Matthew 26, Jesus is about to be unjustly arrested by the leaders of the temple. They have come with many people who have swords in hand and clubs, sticks. They have come to arrest the savior of the world. And Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane has just finished praying, talking to his father about perhaps uh, letting this cup, this this painful experience pass, seeking perhaps another way to do his duty of saving the world, and yet in his selflessness, chooses to drink the bitter cup and to take whatever the Father gives him. It is here after he's been praying. It is here after he's been interceding on our behalf. It is here after he's been dealing with all of this 
that the crowd comes, led by a disciple of Jesus, led by Judas. Mm -hmm. For you do know that sometimes the people who have walked with you are the ones who will come to get you. It is Judas who gives uh, his enemies a sign that the one whom I greet with a kiss is the one that you should arrest. This means that the multitude was mixed. Some of them knew the identity of Jesus. Others did not. It is noteworthy that Judas has to give them this sign because these people, this mixed multitude, had people who knew his identity, could recognize him by his face and by his voice. Yet there were others in the crowd with swords and clubs in hand who got caught up in a mob mentality, who did not even know the identity of Jesus, so much to the point that Judas had to give them a sign of who the person was. I'm already preaching. You do know that if you're not careful, you can get caught up in a mob mentality where you don't even know the history, you don't know the data, you don't know the facts, but you join in in an emotional uh, storm of people who tell you things that you cannot corroborate, who tell you things that you have not personally researched, and you can get caught up in a mob mentality mentality attacking a group of people or a person that you don't even recognize. It is here that this crowd, this mixed multitude, some who knew him, some who didn't, come to arrest Jesus. Judas kisses him. And then G Jesus says, friend, do what you came to do. Please dispense with all the pleasantries. I don't need you to be kind and courteous. I don't need you to even be respectful right now. I just need you to do what you came to do. The crowd then now having identified this, this, huh, this so-called savior that they had come to get, it is here now that Jesus, hmm, it is here now that Jesus witnesses something as he is arrested and one of his trusted disciples reacts. The Bible says one, one who was with Jesus. Matthew does not identify him, but we know by corroborating with Luke and Mark's story yes. that it is indeed Peter. That Peter, Simon, who Jesus called Peter, pulls out a sword wow. to get revenge for his leader. Peter is angry and retaliates mm -hmm. at the unjust treatment, the seizing, the violent and abrupt seizing of Jesus. He sees their hands on one who is innocent. He sees the unjust treatment of a savior who is only healed, who is only redeemed and only restored humanity. And in his righteous indignation, he wants to get revenge, pulls out a sword and cuts off the ear of one who is standing by. Jesus witnesses the vengeful action of Peter. Don't miss this. And tells him, put your sword away. Jesus wants Peter to know that revenge is not in the hands of Peter. Jesus is trying to get Peter to know that just because, just because something is wrong doesn't mean I need you to take action into your own hands. Just because you have the power to do something doesn't mean you have the authority to do something. Just because something unjust is happening does not justify you coming back at a higher level of intensity okay. to gain revenge. I hope you hear me today, for I am speaking not only to that which is happening in the Middle East, but to that which is happening, happening in your own family. 
in your own relationships, in your own marriage, and in your own situation. We've got to understand that just because we are treated unjustly, just because people do us wrong, just because people talk about us out the side of their neck and, and take our names and run it through the mud. Do I have some witnesses of people who've been treated wrong? Well, you did good for people and all you got back in response was bad. Where, where you sacrificed time for them and they took your meekness and saw it as weakness and came against you when you did not come for them. When enemies rise up to take your name down so that they can lift themselves up. Do I have anybody in the chat of people in even who are supposed to Where Judas, in a real sense, represents the ones who come against you. I want you to understand this, that Jesus tells Peter, put it away. Today, I want to talk for just a little bit about revenge. Because revenge is a, huh, it is a seductive practice that all of us at some point in our lives will be seduced into practicing because revenge is often, watch this, the reaction that could be justified based on what you have gone through unjustly. Let me say it again. Revenge is the practice that could be logically justified based on the unjust treatment you've gone through. And yet, while what is happening to Jesus is wrong, and yet while Jesus is absolutely innocent, and yet while Peter witnesses the unjust treatment of a man who has only spoken peace, healing, and restoration, the act of taking out his sword, and, act, and enacting violence on those who are dead wrong, Jesus says, I need you to put it away. Yes. Hear this, people of God. Just because you have the power and the justification for getting back people who have done wrong to you uh -huh. does not mean yeah. you have the authority or license to do it. <clears throat> Because Jesus says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You must understand that revenge is a slippery slope. Revenge is the proliferation of a cycle. That once you get revenge on someone, then those people have people who will avenge them. And then when you react to their avengers then people behind you will have to avenge you. It creates a cycle and a community of revenge yes. that leaves God out of it and allows justice to only be in the hands of flawed human beings. I just said something because the Bible says the crowd that came, came with many swords uh -huh. and clubs, which meant that Peter had one sword, uh -huh. but the crowd had many swords and clubs. Uh -huh. Peter would ultimately lose the fight yes. because he did not have enough swords to fight the crowd. Yes. One of the reasons why Jesus says, put it away, is because he's looking at the fact that they got a whole lot of swords. Yes. And if Peter starts this fight, he would not be able to finish it. Have you ever considered that if you retaliate the My way God. people have come against you, you might not be able to finish what you started? <clears throat> well, you might say, Pastor, I didn't start it. They started it. So if they started it, it's my job to finish it. I feel you, but you got to understand yeah. that just because they started it, uh -huh. please understand, do not huh, 
overestimate your ability to finish it because it is never really finished. Never. Just because you clap back, ah. just because you said something to hurt their feelings, uh -huh. just because when they went low, you went lower, ah. that does not mean that you've stopped because the frailty of humanity yes. is that we always have to have the last word. And once you feel you've had the last word, guess what? They've got to get the last word. And after they feel they got the last word, then you will be pushed to put in another last word. It creates a cycle and a community. This viciousness of humanity until humanity has gone down into depravity. Oh, y'all better hear me today. <clears throat> the problem with revenge is that you never have enough to really get the people back. People who attack you will always have more weapons at their disposal because it's how they live. Hear me. Huh? When people attack you unjustly, you cannot hmm, respond with revenge because to do that, you have to play their game. The reason they will always have more weapons against you in the, in the art or in the practice of revenge is because they live by a code of attacking innocent people. Y'all better hear me today. So if you sink down to their level, oh you then have to adopt the weapons they use. Oh. <clears throat> Y'all better get this today. Uh -huh. So the reason you can't get down to their level, you saying, but preacher, they did me wrong. Preacher, they said what they said wasn't right. I got some stuff on them. I know some things about that. I can pull out some stuff okay. that they've said to me that I can pull out some stuff on them. But here's the thing. If you do it, you then have to adopt the code they live by. The code they live by is to attack people who didn't start anything with them. And if you start doing that, then you'll start hurting innocent people too. Okay, now. Your revenge only provokes more responses and if you keep trying to get revenge, you will be dragged down by the spirit of revenge. Will you become just like them? So Jesus says, Peter, put it away. Now, now let us examine this because we are humans. This is Jesus who is both human and God, 100% both. And yet we wrestle in our humanity with the words of Jesus to Peter. Because some of us don't want to hear those words as Jesus speaks it to us. Because we got some people we're planning to get back. We've got some plans afoot in our minds. We got some, some strategies, some tactics in our back pocket we can use because we're going to get them back for what they did to us. Why do we seek revenge? Why is it that we say things like, you know, try Jesus, <laughs> don't try me? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, because I fight. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll get back at you. You come for me, I'll come for you. It is this human response. It is this, uh, it is this leaning towards making sure people don't do us uh, like that. But I, I, I want us to talk about this for, I think, first of all, we must understand we seek our own revenge because we don't trust God to handle our haters. Oh, hear me, hear me. When we reach for our sword, yeah. it is because we don't believe oh. God will get justice for us. Mm. We just don't believe it. <laughs> See, Peter's standing there and he cannot believe that Jesus ain't doing nothing about these unjust, ungodly people who have come to bother him. And, and the reason Peter reaches for the sword is because he says, if God, if the Son of God is not going to do anything about this injustice, then I've got to do something. Let's be real. The reason we clap back, the reason we say stuff to that person uh, we reach down and get something we know we shouldn't say, but we say it anyway to get them back is because at the core of our being in that moment, 
we do not trust God to handle our haters. And so if God ain't going to come down and shut their mouths, we will. If God ain't going to come down and tell them to stop, then we are going to make them stop. The truth is that there are times I'm talking from a real place because I've been there where I clapped back. I did something to get somebody back. I got my revenge. I said stuff I shouldn't have said. Why? Because at that moment, I did not trust God to get my back. Because God allowed them to do it. God allowed them to say it. God allowed them to perpetuate it. I'm looking at what God has allowed and I'm saying, well, God, if you ain't stopped them by now, maybe it's my job to step up and I should shut them down. We got to understand the reason we seek revenge is that there is an inherent distrust in those situations of God's ability, watch this, or his willingness to handle our haters. But secondly, we seek our own revenge like Peter because we huh, are tired of being mistreated or seeing innocent people attacked. When we reach for our swords, it is because, it is because hear this, that when we are attacked in our innocence, yeah. It triggers our past trauma and it reminds us of how we've been hurt in the past. Woo! When we reach for our swords of revenge, it is because our past trauma has been triggered and old wounds have been ruptured. See, Peter, don't miss this. Peter reaches for his sword of revenge because Peter was there. When these same people came to get Jesus, they wanted to kill him in John chapter 10, verses 30 through 39, when Jesus said that I am, before Abraham was, I am, and the Father and I are one. It was when Jesus made this declaration of unity with the Father that they called him into question for his blasphemy and heresy. And your Bible says that they wanted to stone him. They, in fact, picked up stones. And Jesus asked them, why do you stone me? Is it because of all the miracles that I'm signs that I've done or because I said that I'm one with the Father? They claimed that because he said he was one with the Father, they wanted to kill him. And Jesus had to escape and go to, into the wilderness where his cousin John the Baptist had preached and hid out there for a little while. Don't miss the context because the context will explain the conflict. You've got to understand that Peter, oh God, I feel this, is triggered when he sees some of the same people who tried to kill and stone Jesus before and his past Trauma was triggered, so now he reaches for his sword. Peter saw the unjust treatment of Jesus happening again, and he was triggered because he had seen this before, and he was not about to let this go down. And what you must understand is my beloved brothers and sisters of the Jewish community have been triggered because they have been through horrible and devastating trauma through history. They have endured centuries and even millennia of hatred and vitriol from people who refuse to recognize their humanity and the image of God in them. And it is understandable when an act of horrible violence that was perpetuated by Hamas on, on innocent people dancing in the desert, it was a horrible, violent, 
uh, uh, thing that happened to them, a war crime. It is terrible when war crimes are visited on the state of Israel that they would seek revenge because they have vowed never again. Remember, they had been through the Holocaust. Remember, they almost faced the extermination of their people. It is understandable and explicable for them to say we don't want this to happen to us again because when this happens, it triggers past trauma, period, full stop. There is no, there is no equivocation that it was wrong what happened to the people of Israel. And when your past trauma and historical pain is triggered, you can often respond in ways that are just as unjust as what people did to you. Who attacking innocent people while they're dancing in the desert is immoral and deplorable. It is a war crime. And denying food, water, and electricity to innocent women and children in the Gaza Strip is also a war crime. And when your past trauma and historical pain is triggered, you can end up responding in ways that are just as unjust as what people did to you. Because one war crime does not justify another war crime. And God's children are all children. Israelis and Palestinians, that our brothers and sisters, yes, live in the state of Israel, but our brothers and sisters also live in Gaza. And we must understand that when people do something to you, you better be healed enough you better understand your humanity enough. You better recognize their humanity enough to not stoop to their level so that we all become a community of depravity. But let's not talk about the Middle East. Because some of y'all mad that I even went there. Let's talk about you. Because when someone does you wrong, and you want to get them back, or you want to hurt them back, it's often because they triggered a pain of your past. And when that happens, innocent people who have nothing to do with what happened to you 10 years ago get hurt when you are triggered by your past trauma. You better preach, Holy Ghost. I'm in your text. Peter is triggered by what happens in John chapter 10 when they wanted to stone Jesus. So he pulls out the sort of revenge. But watch this. He doesn't get the Pharisee who came to get Jesus. He doesn't get the scribe who came to get Jesus. He doesn't even go for Judas who came to betray Jesus. He cuts off the ear of a servant named Malchus who was innocently standing by. Malchus Malchus had nothing to do with the arrest of Jesus. Malchus had nothing to do. He was a servant who was simply standing ably by to serve his master. And Peter doesn't get Judas. Peter doesn't get the Pharisee. Peter doesn't get the Sadducee. Peter doesn't get the scribe. They were guilty. No, Peter goes off and takes the ear of an innocent bystander. And I don't care what our government says. There's a whole lot of Malchuses in Gaza right now. There's a whole lot of innocent women and children, Malchus, who are getting their ears cut off, their limbs blown off, whose lives are being cut down. They, they do not agree with Hamas. They don't want Hamas to represent them. They do not agree with Hamas's deplorable legacy and policy of eradicating Israel as a state. And yet, Malchus keeps getting his ear cut off. And what I want to let you know is, in your own life, how many innocent people caught the spray of your revenge because you were not healed enough to move past what happened in your past? 
I'm talking to somebody here. You better get free. You better get healed. You better get some therapy. You better understand that if you don't get healed, the next generation will pay for your past trauma. If you don't get healed, the family drama will be perpetuated in the next generation because the aunties and uncles ain't talking to each other. But guess what? The children of the uncles and aunties, they learn from their parents. Now the cousins ain't talking to each other. Oh, you better save me a seat. I'm going to sit right down beside you today because there is a spirit of revenge that is among God's people. And we keep justifying it by saying they shouldn't have done me like that. They shouldn't have treated me like that. I got to defend myself. I got to come for them because they came for me. No, the devil is a liar. You better get healed or Malchus will lose his ear. Oh, God, I'm almost through. But you've got to understand, they hit you where it still hurts. That's why you responded greater than they hurt you. They hurt you where it still hurts. That's why you came back at them at a higher level than they came at you. And you want to get them back. But you've got to understand a few things. First of all, you are human. It is human to want to repay those who robbed you. It is human to seek to treat others the same way you've been treated. I don't want to overlook the fact that every one of us are human. It is natural to want to be able to get folk back who did you wrong. It is human. But you got to understand as human believers who serve a supernatural God who supersedes our natural tendencies is that while we are yet human, we have access to supernatural power for healing. Woo, you better get it. That even though we're human, we've got to have some healing. Because if we are healed from what happened to us, if they never gave you an apology, you can still be healed. If they never said they were sorry, you can still be healed. If they still act in the fool, you can still be healed. If they never called you up and sorted out what they said that was wrong, you can still be healed. Because how many of you know you don't need them to give you an apology? for you to get healed. All you've got to know is the mercy and the grace of God. All you've got to feel is the love of God bearing you up. All you've got to know is that God is with you, that God is for you, that God is over you, that God goes before you, and that God's got your back. That if you are in Christ Jesus, you can be healed so that folk who don't even recognize what they did to you will not have power over you. Because when you are seeking revenge, it means the people who did you wrong still have power over you. But power, real power, healing, real healing comes when you can do me wrong and I'll shut my mouth and I'll wait on God to fight my battles. I wish I had somebody here that knows that God can do it. Uh, so I got to go. Um, how do we overcome? You're saying, preacher, I hear you talking all this good talk, all this pacifist talk, all this nonviolence talk, all this non-revenge talk, but make it real for me, preacher. How can I do it? Sounds good, but how do I apply it? Well, well, there's a few things. It's right there in your text that you got to do in order to put it away, to put your revenge away, to put your anger away, to put all that stuff that's killing your joy away. How do you overcome this desire, this human desire for revenge? Number one, you better take notes. You got to remember what God's word said about you. Uh, 
It's the first thing. I'm going to show you. It's right in your text. You got to remember, remember what God's word said about you. Look in your text. Jesus, after he tells him to put it away, he says, now, do you not know the scriptures have to be revealed? Okay. Oh, notice Jesus in his answer to Peter's revenge says, don't you remember that the scriptures prophesied that this has to be revealed. See, you've got to remember in the midst of how people do you wrong, come here, come here, come here. You got to remember what God said about you. You, you. you cannot only hold on to what okay. society okay. and culture says okay. the way you should be treated. You've got to remember yeah. what God what said God. about you in relationship to other people. The scripture tells us, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. See, y'all not going to shout right there <laughs> because Jesus told them, they see the scriptures revealed what's going to happen. Okay. That you are going to be reviled. Folk going to drag your name through the mud. People going to do you wrong and utter all kinds of evil against you. But Jesus told Peter and the disciples, blessed are you when that happens. The scripture warns us in this world, you will have trouble, huh? but I have overcome the world. The scriptures tell us no weapon formed against you shall prosper huh? and you shall refute every tongue. See, y'all stopped reading. <clears throat> and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. He never said the weapon wouldn't be formed. He said that when they form it, it will not succeed. And every person who raised their tongue against you, God said, I'm going to get them back for you, declares the Lord. But see, the reason you keep doing it by yourself is because you didn't read the word. His word said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The word says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The scriptures tell us, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You've got to remember what the word said about you. If the word says I'm more than a conqueror, if the word says I am an overcomer, if the word says God will deal with my enemies, then I want you to tell somebody today, I'm going to wait on God huh, to fulfill his will. Huh? Because if his word said I'm going to have trouble, his word also says I've overcome the world. Huh? If his word says the weapon will be formed, his word also says it won't succeed. If his word says they're going to put their mouth on me, but then God's going to deal with them, then I'm going to believe the word. Secondly, not only remember what the word says about you, number two, retain your dignity by recognizing your authority. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm right here in the passage. Retain your dignity. By recognizing your authority. You see, Peter had to understand who he was. Peter lost his dignity in that moment by responding in vengeful anger because he had forgotten where he was and who he was. See, your power is in your restraint. Peter should have realized the person with huh, authority is the person who practices restraint. Because Peter, oh, don't miss this. Peter had been given power 
over the enemy. Jesus gave the power to all the disciples to trample over serpents, to heal every sickness, power even over demonic powers. So don't miss the connection. Peter is walking around with such authority that he had previously called demons out of people. And yet in this moment, he's dealing with humans who do not have demonic power. And yet he stoops down to their level when he has authority over the enemy. See, when you understand who you are and the power you got, you don't have to stoop down to their level because you understand your authority is in your dignity. This is what Dr. King was trying to teach us. Reverend Abernathy, John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Diane Nash, Roberta Yancey with the SNCC movement, they were trying to get us understand to understand that nonviolent resistance is not a sign of weakness, no, but that nonviolent resistance is a sign that our authority is in our dignity. Huh? That's why we'll dress up in church clothes and walk out there to get bit by dogs. That's why they dressed up in church clothes yeah. and walked out there to get drowned in the fire hoses of Birmingham. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we'll go out there in church clothes yeah. and have them beat us with billy clubs in Selma yeah. because there is a dignity uh, that is inherent in our authority. Yes. We know who we are. Father. We will not respond like yes. you. And when we don't respond like you, yes. we show you we got more power than you <laughs> because we got power that does not reside in this human realm. And because we will not stoop down to your level, we ain't under you. We're actually above you. Uh, I wish somebody would get this today, huh? that your authority comes from you being able to retain your dignity. Let them talk. Let them rumor. Let them gossip. I wish I had time to testify about what people said about me, how people in authority put their name on my reputation and tried to bar me from my ordination, ah. made up lies about me, Jesus. tried to stop me from pastoring and preaching. Ah. But I ah. got a word from the Lord Jesus. one Sabbath morning hey. when an old saint of the church ah. that I have pastored previously yeah. called me and said, Pastor Knight, I heard what the conference is trying to do to you. Ah. I heard what they're saying about you. Yeah. I know it ain't true. Ah. She said, be still. Ah. And watch what God will do. She said, don't you open your mouth to say anything about them because God is about to flip this thing. And I stayed silent and I listened and I retained my dignity because my dignity was my authority. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that God will flip that thing so that your haters will go under you so that the people who came for you uh, will go under you. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, I live to see it, uh, that my enemies uh, became my footstool uh, and I climbed over them uh, to another elevation uh, because my dignity uh, was retained in my authority. I gotta go, huh? I feel this thing. Can I preach it like I feel it? You better remember what God's word said about you. You better retain your dignity by recognizing your authority. You ain't got to say everything. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to set the record straight. I'm a living witness that when you let God deal with your haters, can't nobody fix them like God. It'll get to the point where God, where you'll have to tell God, God, that's enough. You don't got them back so good. God, take your hand off them now. God, they got the message now. God, would you let up just a little bit? Because can't nobody deal with your haters like God. I got to go. I got to go. Uh, uh, but the last thing is that you got to recognize 
who's in control. You better recognize who's in control. Drop that in the chat. You better recognize. You better recognize. You better recognize who's in control. Peter reaches for the sword because he done lost his mind and think that he knows that he's in control. But Peter didn't recognize who he was standing beside. Oh God, I, I gotta go with this. Peter takes out his sword to try to defend Jesus, but he did not recognize who he was trying to avenge because oh, Jesus wow. says, wow. Peter, who are you to defend me with a sword? He said, do you not know I can call my father? <laughs> And my father will dispense 12 legions of angels. You got one measly sword, but I got access to all the power of heaven. I can get thousands down here at the snap of my finger or the lifting of my eyebrow. He said, Peter, I don't need your sword. Put it away. Because I am still in control. And that's a word for somebody. Because although it looks like you might be losing, God said, put it away. I'm still in control. While it looks like they might be getting the better of you, Jesus says, put it away. I got it under control. He says, because Peter... If you kill them all, if you kill them, they won't arrest me. If they don't arrest me, I won't be tried. If they don't try me, they won't put a crown of thorns on my head. If they don't put a thorn of crowns on my head, a crown on my head, then they won't pierce me. If they don't slap me, if they don't spit on me, if they don't ridicule me, if I don't get to the cross, then they won't pull me up on Calvary. Then they won't put me on. On the cross then they won't kill me if they don't kill me then they won't bury me if they won't bury me then I can't be raised if I can't be raised then you can't have power if you don't have power then you will lose if I don't get up then you won't get up Peter put it away I don't need your help this is all part of the plan. It's going according to plan. I need them to arrest me. I need them to pierce me. I need them to do me wrong. I need them to pierce my side. Cause I need the blood to flow. Because if the blood flows, you'll be saved, Peter. If the blood flows, Matthew will be saved. If the blood flows, I'll save Paul. If the blood flows, I'll save revision. If the blood flows, put away your sword and let the blood flow. Hallelujah. Put it away. Hallelujah. It's all going according to plan. Put it away. You don't think he knew what they would say about you? You don't think he was aware of the gossip that was forming in their mind before they spoke it? He could have shut their mouth, but he didn't because it's all according to plan. He needs you to stand still and put it away. Let God get your enemies. Let God deal with those family members and let your dignity be your authority as you remember what God already said. Put it away. Put it away. Do not respond. Do not react. Your power is in trusting in his power to deal with your enemies. My brother, my sister, I know you are, you feel justified. I know you've got reasons to want to get them back. But in the name of Jesus, put it away and watch what God will do.
for you. I want to pray. I want to pray for those today who are dealing with and struggling with the fact that some things happened to you that were not right. They were unjust. As a people, we deal collectively with trauma and pain from the past as we were unjustly and immorally brought in chains to this side of the world. And yet, the beauty of our people, ah, the beauty of our people is that we have learned from our creator, from our God, that we do not have to do to them. We do not have to do to America what they have done to us. For we trust the God that we knew before they ever came to our shores. We trust this God who said, vengeance is mine. I need you today to put your sword away. And, and, and I want to pray for you because it's hard. It's What I've described is not easy. But it is possible through Jesus to trust him that he loves you enough that you can put it away. Today, I want to pray for your healing. I want to pray for your restoration of peace. I want to pray, as we pray for peace in the Middle East, I want to pray for peace in your very soul, that you will not take up arms to get revenge for how you were wrongly treated, but that you will trust the God who loves you and your enemy just the same. And I'm praying for your healing. I'm praying for your deliverance from anger that erodes you from the inside out. I'm praying that God will get the glory as you trust him. Because it's all going according to plan. Huh. So just put it away. Let's pray, Father. Oh, God, we thank you. God, who is both father and mother, who who protects and yet nurtures, yeah. who understands the complexity of our humanity. Thank you, God, that you allow us to be human, to have feelings and emotions that are justified by our wrongful treatment and that it is not wrong to feel angry about injustice. It is not wrong to feel bad and to feel frustrated about the fact that we were done wrong and yet, you give us power to heal past our hurts so that we do not create a cycle of violence and revenge. God, we thank you for your love that overpowers evil. God, please help us not to stoop to the level of those who have hurt us, but help us to trust in you who sees all and yet is still in control. We trust that you are just, that you are kind, that you are compassionate, and that you will make all wrong things and you will turn them upside down to bring justice. So God, give us peace. God, give us a, a spirit of waiting. Help us to be able to wait on you and watch what you do to our enemies. God, you told us through your son, Jesus, to pray for our enemies. And so God, even in this moment, we pray for those who have said wrong things, who have done wrong things, who continue to do it. We pray for their conviction and change. And in the meantime, God, help us, oh God, to remain uh, in our dignity and to know you are in control. We thank you. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen today, the appeal is here for those of you who want to give your life to Jesus, for those of you who want to trust this Jesus who shows us what to do, even in the midst of injustice. We serve a savior who was unjustly jailed, tried as a criminal, crucified, executed, even though he had done nothing wrong, but yet had power when he got up power to overcome the unjust systems of this world, power to overcome evil itself. And if you want to give your life to this Jesus, and or if you want to join this church 
This church that is dedicated to living the way of Jesus, which includes justice, which includes human dignity for all God's people. You want to be part of this church. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, or you want to transfer your membership to Revision Church Atlanta, wherever you are in the world, you can join Revision Church. Please use this QR code. Just open your phone app, point it towards the screen, open the app, even on your tablet, the phone app, point it towards the screen even now, and it will generate the form where you can sign up. You could say, listen, I want to get baptized in the next baptism as a public declaration of my love for Jesus, or I want to, I'm already baptized, but I want to join this church. I've been roaming around. I need a church like this who is dedicated to this kind of ministry. I want to be able to join Revision. You can do that even now. We welcome you, those who are giving your life to Jesus, those who are joining Revision all across this country and all around the world. We thank you for being part of this community, and we'll be in touch with you. May God bless you today. One of our pastors, assistant pastors, is going to come back and close us out and remind us of our giving. I want to thank you as lead pastor of this church. I want to thank you personally for your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness and how you continue to support this ministry. May God bless you as our pastor comes to lead us out um, as we uh, will close out this service. We'll see you at 3.30 for our voting education program. God bless you. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Wow, praise the Lord. Amazing. Just what a powerful sermon from Pastor Knight. Put it away. Oh, such amazing. So amazing. Listen, as Pastor Knight has shared, listen, we want to say thank you all again for worshiping with us um, and for just allowing just the spirit to lead in this space. Um, listen, we want to say thank you again for your continual giving. Um, and so, again, you can give via our website at revisionchurchatlanta.org slash give, um, or you can give via our PayPal as well. And those there are on the screen at Revision Atlanta for PayPal and on our website is revisionchurchatlanta.org. All right. And again, again, we look forward to seeing you today at 3.30 if you have not already, we encourage you go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen on the on the screen uh, so that you can learn more about our voter um, forum so that you can be able to learn more about our rights as voters. And so we look forward to seeing you out there. Um, the link is also in our chat as well as the address as well. And so we look forward to seeing you here at 330 uh, for just a few moments. We want to take a time. We are so excited that we have new members who are joining our congregation and all, we're also sad to see some new members leave as well. And so today we want to do the first reading of our transfers in and our transfers out. All right. And so at this time, let's go ahead and do that reading. We're going to go ahead and put it on the screen. All right. So for transfers in from Atlanta West End SDA Church, we have Alexandria Jimerson and John Jimerson from Ellenwood from New Hope SDA Church. In Ellenwood, Georgia, we have Brandon Haynes from Decatur, Decatur SDA Church. Uh, we have Neela Hines and from Foothills Community SDA Church in Chandler, Arizona, we have Marion Thompson, all right? And then for our transfers out, we have Jada Muhammad going to the Voice of Truth Adventist New Work in the new work Delaware. All right. And so this was our first reading. And so we encourage you next week, we're going to head and do our second reading and we're going to vote these individuals in and also for the individual that's leaving, we're going to vote them out. And so listen, we encourage you. If I read you one of your names, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person next week so that we can greet you so that we can shout you out and so that we can give you a good revision welcome, okay? And so listen, Revision Church family, again, we're so happy that you decided to worship with us today. We look forward to seeing you at 3.30 today, remember? And also we want to remind you that we have the shift coming up next week at seven o'clock on Wednesday as we talk about breast cancer awareness, all right? But let's close out with a word of prayer before I let you go. God, Lord, we're so grateful today because your spirit, we have felt you. 
And God, we've experienced you. And God, we're so grateful for your word. Put it away. God, may we remember, God, that you have our back. And God, Lord, we pray that, God, in the same ways that we were traumatized, that we would not reciprocate that trauma on the others. But God, Lord, may we just be able to lean and trust on you, that you have us and that you are covering us. And so, God, again, we pray that as we leave from this virtual space, um, God, that we may not leave from your presence. So be with us is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Revision Church family, again, thank you for worshiping with us. We look forward to seeing you today at 3.30. If we don't see you at 3.30, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at 7 o'clock for this shift. Take care. God bless you. And uh, we're so happy that you worship with us.